Yes, thank you very much. So it is an uh, honor and a pleasure to be able to contribute to this week's festive uh, events. Uh, yes, yeah, so I first met Jurek, it was 28 years ago, indeed, when we were postdocs at Syracuse. So uh, I was a new newcomer postdoc, and Jurek had uh, more experience of in Syracuse at that time already. And Jurek was very uh, kind in showing me the ropes of where to go, uh, especially for uh, a foreign arrival postdoc. Uh, it was very helpful. And uh, we. Where is the catch? <laughs> well, I'm trying very hard not to make a Brexit joke because none of them are funny. <laughs> okay. So I don't think we've written papers together, have we? No. Uh, but we've interacted on, on a number of occasions. Uh, we've examined uh, at least one thesis together and so on. And uh, one thing I've learned is... Uh, that when you interact with Jurek, uh, you should expect that something unexpected is going to happen. And I was reminded of one of those events recently. So back in 2008, uh, there was a quantum geometry and quantum gravity conference at Nottingham. And the uh, scientific organization committee made a strong recommendation that we should invite Jurek to give a plenary talk on a specific topic on which Jurek had done recent work. So we did invite Jurek. Jurek was, uh, 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 so uh, Jurek accepted. Two days before the start of the meeting, Jurek sent us an email. Could I please change the topic of my talk? <laughs> Still was within the um, remit of the meeting. Talk went quite well, but it was somewhat unexpected. And the reason why I was reminded of uh, this recently was uh, that this week, on Monday, I was talking to Jurek um, about some work that I had been doing recently. And Jurek said, uh, he has colleagues here in Warsaw who would be interested in that topic. Uh, am I going to talk about that topic here? Uh, I wasn't going to. <laughs> Uh, well, we had some discussion, and uh, we agreed that despite of uh, Jurek's preferences, today's talk will be delivered on the topic on which it had been announced. But if there are anyone, who, uh, uh, if there are people who wish to talk about analog gravity experiments, I will be happy to do that privately. So, uh, right. So the topic here, it is. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Topic here is modified gravity, energy extraction from black holes in certain types of modified gravity theories and implications on thermodynamics, black hole thermodynamics. And the specific uh, theories we have in mind are theories that violate local Lorentz invariance. This is uh, work uh, mostly based on a paper written by persons shown over here. Uh, so uh, Thomas Sotirio at Nottingham and David Mattingly at the University of New Hampshire. They are senior uh, Lawrence violators, if you like. Uh, Jishnu Bhattacharya was at the time a postdoc in Nottingham. Robert Benkel was a PhD student at Nottingham. Now he is a postdoc at the Einstein Institute in Potsdam. And if I have some time, I will uh, tell uh, about recent generalizations done by two uh, undergraduate student uh, summer internships uh, at Nottingham. Maybe I should mention that uh, the bulk of this work was done at Nottingham in the United Kingdom. And a significant part of the funding that made this work possible did come from European Union. Right, so the specific title is over here, Protection Theorem. There is a theorem, this perfectly rigid, uh, precise mathematical theorem here at the uh, core of the work. But interestingly enough, this is not the title of the paper that we wrote. This was the title of an early draft of the manuscript. But then uh, one of the co-authors objected, and he said, if we put the word theorem anywhere in the paper, then the eyes of the target audience will glaze over, 
And if we put the word theorem in the title, the target audience will never even make it to the abstract. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so we, we used some euphemism. I think we called obstruction or something in, in the paper. But at the core, there is a uh, theorem. It's a classical theorem about energy extraction. So here's the plan. Um, I'll first uh, recall a few phenomena about energy extraction in Einstein gravity from black holes via Penrose processes. Now, this is, of course, uh, things that are, f uh, that are familiar to us. We have been teaching this in, uh, uh, in a relativity class to students. And when working on this, I discovered that I had been telling untruths to my relativity class for 20 years. And that is one reason why I want to say a few things about these uh, <coughs> well-known things over here to set the stage. Then uh, we are talking about Lorentz violating theory, so I should tell what the formulation over here. And then I'll outline how in these Lorentz violating uh, theories there are Penrose processes that are more general, sort of un unexpected compared with the Penrose processes you have in Einstein gravity. In particular, you see here this keyword spherical symmetry. There is uh, energy extraction already in the case of spherical symmetry, and uh, that is where, uh, where I want to go. And then, uh, so there are the core results. There are two theorems. One theorem says there is something non-trivial to prove here, and the second theorem says, uh, yes, we excluded energy extraction under certain, we argue, reasonable assumptions. And then I'll end up with some um, upshots as time permits. Any um, questions at this point? Comments? That was on anti -decitter space. And I remember, uh, yes, that was not on energy extraction. That was on anti -decitter space. So what, whatever may have been wrong there was on this particular point. <laughs> OK, so uh, let's recall how energy extraction from black holes works in Einstein gravity. Here is a picture from a book that we know, and as we learned from Ted Newman on Monday, we have strong feelings about this book. Right? Uh, so the basic scenario is here. You, uh, so the collision version, the, the splitting version of a Penrose process goes back to the paper over here. You drop a shuttle with payload near a curved black hole. There is the ergo region, the region where the killing vector that's time-like at infinity goes space-like. Then you eject your payload. You eject the payload against the rotation. This kick your uh, gives your uh, spaceship a kick, and it comes fa faster, as you can see over here. And there, then, you collect the energy. And this way, you can extract energy, rotational energy, from the black hole. And there's nothing uh, paradoxical about this. We have an understanding of where the energy comes from. It comes from the rotational energy of the black hole. And uh, in the picture, we have a large sphere where we send the stuff from and where we collect things. We should think of it as a collection at infinity. And when we do that, then the energy budget is unambiguously drawn in terms of the conserved quantities at infinity. Okay. Uh, so this is how the process is usually presented. This is how Penrose and Floyd uh, did it in their paper. Um, and this is how I've been doing it in relativity class for 20 years. So what's the catch? The process as drawn here uh, does not appear for arbitrary values of this uh, ratio j over m squared. It's known to exist when j over m squared is bigger than a certain critical value, worked out in this paper. And then the paper makes a strong conjecture that the process doesn't actually exist when j over m squared is less than that value. It doesn't seem to be proven. The, the non-equatorial motion is, is tricky. But for equatorial motion, they prove that this is if and only if. OK, so uh, 
the number over here, it's approximately 0.8 something. Penrose and Floyd picked an example, 0.9. So it works when this ratio is large enough. It doesn't work when the ratio is small enough. Okay. Uh, now, we shouldn't be too worried about this as a point of principle because we should be thinking of this uh, splitting Penrose process as an idealization of superradiance. And for superradiance, there exists no uh, similar limit. In fact, it is known that if you start talking about astrophysics and you ask, can you extract significant amounts of energy, the splitting process is not very efficient. There are collision versions that are more efficient, and there there's more recent astrophysical literature about this. And that astrophysical literature, curiously enough, knows that there are limitations of this sort. But in the pure relativity literature, this seems to have gone largely unnoticed. So this is the Penrose uh, splitting process in the Penrose and Floyd paper. So it's called Penrose process. It's not called Penrose and Floyd process. And for a good reason. This isn't the first uh, paper where a process like this appeared. There was a paper by Penrose where a tether version appeared. Right? So where you don't send uh, some ballistic systems down, where you instead have observers who lower something down in the ergo region with a tether, let something go, and then uh, roll the tether up. Uh, and uh, so the basic energy budget works the same way, assuming that you can neglect any net effect that uh, your tether brings to the system. Um, last year, I asked Roger Penrose what the history was behind these papers. And Penrose said that he actually thought about the ballistics version first, but he, did, he hadn't done the calculation by the time that he needed to give a talk about this. And in his talk, he had worked out this tether version. Then came the time to write up the talk. And uh, in the paper, in this paper, there's a footnote saying, oh yes, the ballistics version works too. And then the Penrose and Floyd uh, paper came, uh, came out later. So uh, there are these two versions. This is tether version. And the tether version is fine provided you can ignore any net effect of the tether on the energy budget. Okay, and. Uh, Seems reasonable, right? Nevertheless, there's a decades-long uh, debate about this. Um, I mean, significant contributions to black hole thermodynamics have used these tether arguments and so on. So I've just mentioned here two uh, among the more recent of other papers that contribute to this. Um, and I was happy to note that in the posters here, there is one poster that specifically addresses a tether, a rope in curved space-time. What happened? How do you model that rope when it is moving? It, it is an actively ongoing research topic. So, if you want to argue that the uh, th that the uh, effect of the tether is really negligible, you need a good model of your tether. And I don't think you would stand a chance to prove a rigorous theorem about that at that point. So for today, I'll concentrate on the ballistics version of these Penrose processes in the uh, Lorentz violating gravity context. So to, for today, no tethers. Any thoughts at this point? So this is all Einstein gravity. I want to look at certain types of modified gravity theories, okay? Uh, theories that do not have local Lorentz variance. Uh, I'll spell out here the kinematical framework in which I'll describe these theories. It's called Einstein ether framework. And the point is that you do not just have a metric as your dynamical variable. You have an additional dynamical variable, a vector field, vector field that is constrained to be time-like and of unit length. You call it an ether field. It's not an external field fixed from the outset. It is a dynamical field. It has field equations of its own. If you think of it, uh, think of this as a fundamental theory, as Jacobson and Mattingly 
um, uh, started the game and others have followed, then you would have an action in which you have the Einstein-Hilbert term, perhaps then terms that have to do with derivatives of, these, of the ether field. It is a covariant theory, but the solutions are not Lorentz invariant. Lorentz transformations would move that ether. So uh, at any solution, there is a distinguished time-like direction at each point. You can consider other modified gravity theories in this framework, for example, Hojava gravity that starts with a fixed foliation. Uh, but uh, but um, the solutions and the, proper, and the uh, excitations on those solutions, even in Hojava gravity and related theories, can be described in this framework. So this is the framework that I will be using. So there's a metric, I'll call it G, uh, uh, GA, and then there is this time-like unit vector field. Um, so uh, what happens now when you start doing propagation of waves in this theory? So there are excitations in the metric. There are gravitational waves. There are waves that are associated with the ether. If you have some other fields there, they couple to those. So they obey some sort of hyperbolic wave equations, but not necessarily with respect to the original metric that you had. Some of the excitations may obey uh, hyperbolic equations there, but not all. There is a second metric that appears, a derived concept. Given the G and given the ether, there is a second metric that you can form. C here is a constant that is determined by the constants that appeared in your original Lagrangian. Once you specify your theory that C is given, and some of those excitations, they couple to this new metric formula is over there. So what's the formula trying to tell you? Uh, so there's the old metric. What you've done to the old metric is first you've projected out the time part, time being now in the direction of this ether. Then you've added the time part back, but with a different relative weight. If the original light cone is over there, we'll call it the A light cone, then the light cones in this new metric, they do not coincide, they are broader. The B metric is a faster metric. What you thought was the maximum speed limit uh, originally, it's no longer the maximum speed limit. There are some excitations that propagate faster than you thought. Still a causal theory, there is a speed limit like that, but it's bigger than you thought. And uh, it, uh, it can happen, but if you do that, then you could interchange the role of the two metrics and the same, uh, the same uh, idea happens. So I'm choosing to think of it so that I somehow at the start know that this is the original metric and the other is the, der the derived one. You could take a different point of view. I'm describing it in a way where this A is the slow metric and this B is the fast metric. The key point is that there are two different kinds of light cones. Exactly how they come in, in the logic of writing this down is not so relevant, but there are these two different light cones. And as I was saying, there are excitations that follow hyperbolic equations, some in the slow metric, some in the fast metric. And then those excitations, they interact by some local terms in, in your Lagrangian. And now you can start working on those perturbations. And I want to think in this uh, Penrose process, a uh, ballistic system approximation where I'm not dealing with fields, but I'm doing the point particle uh, approximation to all of these excitations. It means I have some slow particles that follow geodesics in the slow metric, some fast particles that follow uh, geodesics in the fast metric, and then uh, what those local interactions get replaced by well, when you teach relativity, uh, introductory special relativity, you usually teach particle collisions over there. It's the same thing that we'll, doing, or, uh, we'll be doing uh, over there. So we do particle collisions and, and particle splittings, and uh, um, uh, a massive particle might split into two photons and, and th th things of that sort. We do exactly the same thing over here, and the uh, conservation law that comes from those local interactions is this now collisions conserving the form momentum. 
there's one piece of fine print. I mean, when we teach this to, um, I don't know, first or second year undergraduates, we say that what's conserved at the collisions is the momentum vector. And that's fine with Einstein theory because vector, I mean, you can raise and lower the index with the metric as you please. Here there are two metrics. So uh, what exactly do we mean by a momentum? Well, so it comes from the conservation law, from the fact that locally you have a tangent space that's Lorentz anyway. So the conservation law is conservation law of the momentum one form. And that encodes this, this, um, uh, uh, this local conservation of energy and momentum. So that's the uh, framework in which I want to look at these Penrose processes. On certain black hole solutions, so I mentioned that spherical symmetry would be a big point today. So we'll be considering solutions that are spherically symmetric. Basically, Schwarzschild with a different radial dependence. All the symmetries that Schwarzschild has, all the asymptotic properties that Schwarzschild has, but with a different uh, spatial dependence. So I've listed here things in, in the appropriate technical language. And those are, we assume there is a horizon over there, and specifically we want to look at the future horizon over there. There may be a singularity there, may not be, whatever the, uh, is over here is not relevant. What is relevant is that there's a horizon. So that's the slow metric for us. Then we put in the ether field, and for ether field we put similar symmetries, right? time translation invariance, uh, asymptotic flatness, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but because now the B metric is faster, what used to be the A horizon is no longer the horizon uh, for the B excitations. The B horizon turns out to be someplace over there. In fact, there doesn't even need to be a B horizon. I'll draw the picture as if there was. Uh, that makes nice pictures, but the core results just say that there is some region here behind the A horizon where you can go and from which the B excitations can disappear. And as you see from this picture, when written in terms of the A metric, this looks kind of strange. I mean, this is somehow the horizon for the fastest excitations that are about, uh, and the picture doesn't look nice. The picture looks much nicer if you draw it in terms of the fast metric in the B metric. Then there's the B horizon that really is the universal speed limit. Then is the A horizon, the A particle, the slow particle speed limit. And between those two horizons, there's a region that you can call the ergo region. For the same reason that in Kerr you call the ergo region the ergo region, there is a certain killing vector that does uh, funny things over there. And uh, right, so this is the kind of solutions I'm thinking of, and such solutions are known, some analytically, many more numerically, so this, this is a class of solutions that uh, are of interest. And here I want to look at the Penrose process, specifically the Penrose splitting process. So let's think what the picture would like, and I'm co I continue to draw the picture in the fast metric, so there is the uh, B horizon. So I have something coming from infinity. Okay, it could be either type of particle a priori. Then there's the splitting event. And you send off an A ejectum and a B ejectum, and you arrange things so that the B, B uh, ejectum comes out to infinity. And now you can start asking all the same energy budget questions you asked in Kerr. And the condition for there to be energy extraction, it can be formulated in terms of this A ejectum over there. You need it to have negative killing energy, and then you've managed to extract things. So, um, so far it ju looks just like Kerr. And we know that in Kerr there's no problem with Penrose processes. We know that in Kerr there is a natural endpoint to Penrose processes, the Schwarzschild hole. What about here? Let's recall this formula and this picture. So what happens in Kerr is that in the Schwarzschild limit, the horizon and the ergo region boundary, they coincide. The ergo region goes away. Here, this cannot happen. Remember, this C was not a constant that differs from solution to solution. 
the C was a constant that comes from the constants in your original Lagrangian. Once you write down your Lagrangian that C is non-negotiable, that C tells how different these two light cones are, the ergo region cannot disappear. Certainly not in any regular way. So there is a question of what would be the